Okay, so today we're going to talk about a case of vertigo uh, that started about two and a half years ago for this lady. Um, started when she abruptly sat up out of bed uh, after oversleeping, uh, immediately started to get vertigo symptoms, uh, had never had this before. She was bumping into walls, walking down the hallway. Uh, she'd call her husband to come help her. Uh, she essentially was bedridden for 36 hours. Um, she had a uh, very nice ENT that came out to her house, paid her a, a home visit, and did an Epley's maneuver on her, which is a repositioning maneuver for BPPV. Um, that helped some, but uh, it didn't quite do the trick completely, and she's been suffering for about two and a half years now from this that uh, has, is a constant failing with every once in a while, which is quite often for her, she'll have severe attacks. Uh, which she can't work, she can't do anything really. So we examined her today uh, looking at uh, the vestibular system and whatever else is involved. She also complained of occipital neuralgia which is pain like a headache basically at the base of the skull uh, that travels forward similar to a migraine almost but j a little bit different uh, which uh, we found intriguing because I assumed that I would find a correlation between the two uh, and as you'll see we were, were correct in that. Um, her, her, she thought there might be a, a connection between the two as well so we definitely took a look at that. Um, after looking at her and doing an exam talking with her for quite a while uh, we were able to determine that it was more of a left unilateral vestibular weakness meaning that the left hemisphere, the left half of the vestibular um, apparatus, which is the part of the brain that controls, one of the parts of the brain that controls balance and coordination, that with the cerebellum. The cerebellum is more of uh, an adapting processor for the, cere for the vestibular system. So the vestibular system does more of the um, kind of, not crude, it's very, it's very uh, complicated actually, um, whatever movement it's supposed to do, and the cerebellum will kind of fine tune it. Um, you know, so it's like uh, very important for this system to regulate itself, uh, which then feeds into the brain stem and the contralateral cortex and then fires down to, uh, you know, all the muscles uh, around your spine uh, in different areas to, to create movement or complicated movement, like uh, making a figure eight with your hand or uh, being able to throw a baseball, uh, what have you. Anyway, with her, we noticed that that left side was particularly weak. Uh, when I had her close her eyes with her feet together, uh, she immediately started to sway back and to the left, which was evident of a left posterior vestibular weakness, potentially. You know, we have to, we have to see what else is involved. Um, but that was kind of a, a, a red flag for that kind of an issue. And when I had her put her feet together and close her eyes, give her a little tap on each side, and there was no uh, response of the contralateral muscles to catch her or to stabilize her. When I pushed her, she shouldn't go all the way over and fall over. I had to catch her both ways. Usually if you hit somebody on the side, their eyes close, they just go a little bit and they come back to normal because that vestibular system fired to the cerebellum, to the contralateral brain, and that brain fired ipsilaterally or same side to those muscles uh, to contract to stop you from you know falling to that side. Um, she didn't have any of that response. Uh, we could have pushed her back quite easily as well. Uh, we didn't because I didn't want to create any kind of an issue with her. Um, so there's not much of a neural response or brain response, nervous system response, when activating or challenging her nervous system or her vestibular and cerebellar system, specifically balance coordination areas. So we knew that was very, very you know weak. Um, did a lot of other testing. Uh, you know, we did a lot of. Uh, optokinetic movements. Uh, we did a lot of gait testing with uh, dual tasking, meaning uh, have her walk down and back while saying every other letter of the alphabet or counting back from 100 by sevens, which she, she didn't like, um, who does in front of people. But uh, when I did that, what happens is it takes more of her brain power away that usually regulates, helps regulate some of that uh, vestibular imbalance, and it made it a little worse. So I noticed that she was walking to the left and also her arm sway was very decreased uh, so there was there was definitely evidence of left-sided vestibular cerebellar issues uh, and maybe a little bit of uh, 
you know, right cortical stuff uh, when she actually had to use it, uh, shut down that side. But her brain was very good uh, cortically, uh, uh, the upper uh, more complicated parts of the brain, that, that, and the mind, if you will. Uh, she, she definitely had very good eye movements, great optokinetics. Uh, so we're going to be able to use a lot of those eye movements to retrain that, cere that left vestibular system because that push back like this, it pushes the eye down. And okay. So in this plane of motion, we're going to be able to do eye targeting or tracking form to retrain that vestibular system and fire it back up, essentially. Um, we're going to have to do some vertical optokinetics to fire that extensor response when she goes, she tilts back, which, by the way, was her most severe response, or it is the most symptomatic. When she tips her head back, she can't even get her hair to the salon. Um, Anytime she puts something up on a shelf, it makes her very dizzy. She loses control, um, so she can't do any of that, which is when you tip your head back, it activates that posterior canal. Um, it's also important to understand that the vestibular system has two different types. Um, you know, there's the uh, labyrinthine system that has different canals, okay? It has a posterior canal, a horizontal canal, and an anterior canal so that it's finely tuned to regulate in different degrees of perception when you rotate angular acceleration um, that uh, you know there's there's you know fine control over it so that it tells your brain what it's supposed to be doing with her that's that's off okay so she's not getting that kind of signaling where she's supposed to have it um, now here's the interesting thing to tie in um, everything together after after all this is that she also had that occipital neuralgia don't forget so we looked at that and we said, okay, what's the uh, viability of that nervous system in that occipital region or at the base of the skull here on the left in that left-sided neck area where, by the way, she also complained of a lot of neck stiffness and pain, uh, older type stuff. Uh, we definitely found ro restricted posterior ribs, anterior rib restrictions. Um, I'll tell you about that in a second. So right through here, there wasn't a message getting up to that vestibular system. Right at the, where she had that really tight area where she has those headaches, where she has that occipital neuralgia, that is seven times more feedback to that vestibular inner ear part that gives her balance than anywhere else in the body. In a sense, if you shut that down, then that vestibular system is not going to have a signal. It's not going to know what it's supposed to do. Therefore, it cannot transfer a message to the rest of the brain to say, hey, when I tip my head back, uh, you know, here's what's going on. Now the brain is all confused. And it says, well, we're going to be dizzy. That's our symptom. That's our response. So she gets very dizzy because there's no feedback there, one of the reasons, right? One of the main reasons, most likely. And that was going on before she had her vertigo, okay? The occipital neuralgia was there for a while, had a long time to not send messages up, weakening that vestibular system and reducing its frequency of firing, we call it, in neurology, or its plasticity, or it just started to climb, right? So then we look at the rest of the, the rest of the cervical spine, the, the ribs. One thing that's interesting is that she had limited rib expansion on that left side. She wasn't getting as much oxygen in, as she needs. So as important as activation is for the brain to feed forward to that, to that vestibular and cerebellar, she didn't have any oxygen either. So her oxygen was limited, making this more susceptible. The brain, and especially these highly metabolic areas of the vestibular and cerebellum, it needs fuel and activation essentially it needs that proper signaling from from this part of the part of the spine base of the skull and the rest of the body but it really needs oxygen and of course nutrition or glucose um, to actually fuel it which i'm sure none of us have any problem getting glucose uh, which is sugar um, so we have to work on both of those now her treatment is going to be comprehensive in the sense of it's going to involve uh, working on that uh, occipital region, that's, that side of the cervical spine, left side, in those ribs um, through chiropractic I mean, uh, adjustments, uh, phys physical rehab to that area to retrain the muscles, and the neurological rehab to retrain those muscles and joints so that the part of the vestibular system picks up that information again and starts to fire up. So when I push her to the side, she catches herself. That it's, it's, a, it's retraining the circuitry of the brain to say, it's already there, it's just very weak. It hasn't been laid down in a while, uh, those tracks, nerv nervous system tracks. So we have to basically connect this inner ear, cerebellum part of the brain, to the, re the opposite cortex to say, hey, this is what's going on. 
this is what you need to start doing so that when I move, when I tilt my head, when I do anything, uh, you're not going to mess up. So we're going to do that through that. Then we're also going